Hello and welcome to episode 14 of the Ammo Hour podcast. We've got a really good conversation for you today. Um, it's a, a guy I've known for quite some time. Uh, we established at the end of this chat um, that we'd only really ever had a couple of conversations before, but someone that's just always been on my radar through his uh, kind of stellar work throughout the music scene, not only in Glasgow, but <clears throat> touring across Europe, uh, the world, um, and, and certainly making a name for himself as a guy that works super, super hard uh, and, you know, quite rightly is enjoying uh, the success um, of of his efforts. Um, he's best known as guitarist in Frontierer and Sectioned. Um, he also uh, launched and, and helps run Global City um, um, Music Management, uh, where he's an artist manager uh, and also director. He also lectures up in his home of Aberdeenshire um, and over the lockdown um, to deal with some um, personal loss um, he focused uh, his attentions on a new project called Lift um, where he tried to you know make the best that he could out of you know really hard times um, and I really respect that more than anything. It's something I can relate to, not on, on that scale, um, but certainly using um, his talents and channeling those into something rather than, you know, sitting in, in what must have been such a, a hard place. So I really, really appreciate him uh, coming on to share that with us. Um, I really would urge you to check out um, all his work, but especially this new project, and of course the, the links will be there in the show notes um, and yeah just just thank him for for coming on really, really awesome guy um, I think he's just a shining example of uh, hard work can pay off if you just give it everything you've got and now he is literally uh, living his life off of music which is uh, something if you're a guy like me you uh, give absolute props to uh, it's the dream but it doesn't come for free and he, he deserves it so yeah enjoy this conversation with Dan um, as always, you can find all the links if you're listening to this and you want to watch it, or vice versa, you want to check out the merch store, um, you can get 20% off uh, by putting the ammo hour at checkout. But all the links to all those places to see it and, and grab uh, a lot of bits of swag and stuff are on our Instagram. So it's just at the ammo hour on Instagram. Uh, please share uh, the podcast if you've got any friends that like it. Please uh, hit subscribe on the YouTube so we can get a, a custom uh, URL and not just uh, the alphabet backwards. Um, and yeah, just, just keep spreading the word if you enjoy these conversations. I'm slowly starting to get into the, the vibe of getting these out a little bit more regularly again. And I've got a, a real awesome list of guests who are all uh, excited to come on and, and chat about their story. So we'll get some awesome conversations for you out there. Um, but you can do your bit if you like what you're hearing uh, by helping us build that and uh, attracting even even uh, more awesome guests so yeah thanks again to dan you'll uh, really enjoy this episode so here we go for episode 14 of the ammo hour i'm here with uh, dan stevenson guitarist in frontier sectioned and now launching your brand new solo project lift uh, also the head man at global city music management how you doing dan you all right Yes, very good, Kyle. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. You've given me a good list of accolades there. I feel a bit like I'm blushing already. <laughs> they're all, uh, they're all uh, prime kind of or, or equal importance, I think, when it comes to talking about you and, and what you represent. So, yeah, I don't think any of them deserve a back seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I've, I've known you throughout your time of, uh, you know, being in these really, really super, super heavy bands and, Obviously, launching your 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 music, the music business and management side of things. Um, I guess you know we'll, we'll have a, a real good chat over this next hour. But what's been the inspiration for Lift? For anyone who's not listened to it yet, and we'll, we'll post all the links. Like, I think it'd be safe to say, in a positive way, Frontier and Section and stuff. Like, you know, you guys are are purposefully jarring people with the sounds. You yeah, know, it's yeah. A neat thing. People love it. Yeah. With this lift is certainly not that. It's like Bon Iver-esque in, in parts and, you know. Yeah, yeah definitely. Like, I think that it's, it's a good point. Yeah, totally. So, like, Frontier and Section are, like, they're made to 
to have an impact and whether that's positive or negative uh, is besides the point as long as people leave feeling like oh my god that that was an experience then that's kind of the thing and um yeah that's been like the last five years of my life um or six years maybe has has been that and that's everything from like touring to like helping campaign release to uh, booking tm and managing helping with back-end finance the whole thing it's like consumed my life so yeah when COVID came um like every musician all the tours are kind of cancelled but we had like quite uh, quite a bit like we had a big bunch of european festivals european tour we had like southeast asia um in, in the works same with like australia new zealand was it was in the plan as well so um yeah i was kind of like well i need to do something creative and i've wanted to make my own record for years and i've i've not been like the primary writer in anything for ages so um yeah I'd, I'd been wanting to do it for a long long time and now that i had the resources and the time and the kind of headspace i was like yeah i'll maybe write a couple of things and um to to kind of answer your question the inspiration i guess was um like a, a bit of a tragic event that happened in my life last year that kind of enforced this need to have a positive outlet instead of a very negative one i've got quite a quite a long history of mental health and um a lot of like bad experiences with it so over the years i've tried to like make mechanisms and have things in place that allow me to to maintain like at least an equal or almost healthy mental health and this record ended up being that for me it, it was essentially a way for me to obsess over something that wasn't just grief and um that ended up being a vast like musical canvas if you want to kind of see it like that um and it was like a long journey of like nearly a year really from like first thing written to uh the release really was, was nearly a year and um yeah it was like a way for me to work through a lot of very complex emotions and so that was kind of the impetus for it and it just kind of grew arms and legs from there so i've, I've been so lucky that like a really bad thing in my life has turned into something so positive in in some ways so that was actually the reason i called the record there is beauty in everything because i, I managed to like yeah like find something in it that was like at least one good thing and if that's that it helps someone else so that there is like a record that someone can relate to then whatever that thing is there there was a good thing that came from it so that was like the whole kind of backstory too i suppose it's awesome great to hear man and um yeah i can relate to a lot of that um i will touch well i guess it's, it's we can touch upon it in a, in a wee minute as well but i've never like gone into the the depths i think i don't know if it's different songwriting or it's just more in-depth songwriting because I've written a lot of songs, you know, loads of Never Seen a Light of Day, as you'll be, mm -hmm. all right that. But very much, not like classical like format, they don't all follow the same format, but I've never gone into like all the textures and sounds and pads and, you know, it must have just been such, uh, although you're saying it's such a, a release, that must have been, you know, a monumental amount of effort as well. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Like historically, I'm not the guy that's the producer type person. Like I actually, I hated using DAWs of any kind. Um, but because I was like in lockdown as well, I, it's not like I could go anywhere to record. So I was just kind of like, I, I spent the first three months actually learning Logic really proficiently. And and I kind of learned to produce as I went a little bit um, and got the mix into the stage I was quite happy with. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's kind of ingrained in creative people in general to be like very obsessive and whether that stays within music or into something else it's just a bit of a through line with a lot of people that are creative and that was the same with this like I, I learned how to make 808s I made the synths I, I like mixed to the level where I could hand it over I, I did a lot of the kind of broader brushstrokes of the design um, for all the aesthetic in the videos so it's like yeah I, I literally I just I've done nothing else almost pretty much for nearly a year so and obviously that you know that's like a way of coping and distracting and those kind of things but in the end it was exactly what I needed because I would have just like you know dwelled into quite a really unhealthy place so like I think that obsession is really good in a lot of ways for people it, it, obviously it has its negative impacts but I think if, if you can you know work that hard on something that you could not do before it's not really a negative side to that I don't think. I think that's something that um, you know <clears throat> it's like a blessing and a curse I guess you know in some respects so I think the highs that anyone who's associated with music, whether you do it to like your level, whether you do it to a local level, maybe in the middle, band like myself, so you've toured quite a bit, but never like full time. You know, we get the highs that other people could never buy in their life. And it yeah. makes you lucky. I mean, a lot of it comes with like lying on the floor and wearing the same clothes, <laughs> but it comes with like a lot of shit too. It's not like always, you know, super, uh, you know, showbiz or anything like that at all. 
However, you do also get a lot of the lows, even when there isn't tragedy in life, like just coming off tour and having to go back to nine to fives and stuff. And you know that part of your brain needs spark so much and you're literally just in the weeds all the time. And I think yeah. that create a lot of the mental health struggles that so many of us, I think, have. Yeah. Not belittling, you know, medical issues as well. But I think a lot of us really feel that awesome wave and then such, such deep lows and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, it's something I've found really difficult my whole career. Even, like I did my first tour, I think, when I was um, maybe 17 or 18. And I've been touring fairly consistently ever since. And I've never really found a way of getting that balance right. And like, yeah, coming back from tour, even at the, the size of a band from Tirar, R, you know, you come from like the last tour I did before lockdown, we were in Scandinavia. So my last show was in uh, Helsinki in Finland. And it was unbelievable. But I went from that to a three drive, a three day drive home into the northeast of Scotland to then like literally like chop logs for like two days at home. And I was just like, there's a real big disparity here. Like I was crowd surfing in Finland three days ago and now I'm on my own, completely isolated alone and just chopping logs in, in the wilderness. And it's just kind of like, the, you know, the, there's beauty to that, but there's also like the, your brain has to adjust to that. That's a very big shift and there's no other line of work that's like... I don't know it's like you just don't get those big peaks and troughs in the same way it's it's a lot to kind of work through i think 100 percent, and, and it's never like i really really envy um people who want to say this in the right way because i literally mean it as a compliment but the people that don't really need that creative thing that we are searching for <laughs> yeah, like, yeah they're happy like I've, I've some of my best friends in the world work in offices you know they're not blind to it they know it's quite a boring job but they progress and make loads of money and have their family time and stuff like that and they can they can do that they've got a bit of their brain that they can say no that's fine this is a trade-off for me to have this life i was always just felt like literally like running up like scraping the walls and in places like that and when i could go into you know i made that career change sitting in my barber shop now but it's been a, a long way to here and i remember mm -hmm. 30 years old going right i want to try and learn this trade and i'm sweeping floors i'm making teas like dealing with people who we weren't on the same page i didn't really get on with them very well i'm going off on tour coming back and, and doing that thinking what the hell like I, yeah. have, I have to make it because life will not be worth living you know and yeah. obviously that's an extreme emotion and yeah. it balances out when you don't necessarily make it of that but yeah i don't think anyone else like feels such like crazy like thoughts about their daily life you know yeah it's really it's quite hard to explain yeah i know i, I know exactly what you mean and it is, is you never want to come across condescending like we're some higher power that are so lucky to be gifted with this talent you know like obviously we're not saying that but yeah you're right like that like yeah i don't know the, the only way you can explain it to someone is like imagine like you've been skydiving once like that feeling every night for a month and then coming home and sitting on your couch like that's the only way that you can explain it and if yeah, if you can't relate to any of those feelings, and that, that's a real shame because everyone should feel that alive at some point, at any point in their life. But um, yeah, as musicians, we kind of have to deal with the discrepancy between and and work it out. But yeah, man, I think it's admirable that you you made that change too because like there is a point where you have to go right. I'm this age. I am busting my balls this much, these many hours, this much money a week for a thing that I'm not getting that return from. So you need the balance. You need that sort of like yeah is it worth it and by the sounds of it you've got that you know a bit more in check now which is really cool to see as well yeah and it was touring that i think i've said on a few podcasts and stuff but it was touring that literally gave me that as well so you know i would have given anything well nearly anything for you know weekend from wolves or, or any musician even just playing in someone else's band to be my life but at a certain point that wasn't going to happen and i made peace with the fact that it was like wasn't because like anyone was shit. It wasn't that people didn't like it. It just didn't get to a point where it was able to pay. Mm -hmm. but, but being able to go, well, that doesn't mean you need to then just pack in a suitcase and do the things that your brain is going to kill you for. So go <laughs> yeah. to these cool wee places in Europe and you'll be one of my uh, next guests on the podcast, uh, a, guy, a guy called Jasper, who was in this awesome band called Stark, a hardcore band. I've had uh, the, the front person on, Roos. She's an amazing vocalist. Um, she's been on a previous episode um, playing with those guys and being in this cool little town in Arnhem uh, in Netherlands and he had like this bike repair and coffee shop and I saw that he could be doing this at night it wasn't necessarily paying him anything but he was having that great release and having those highs but then during the day he had his own tunes on his own people yeah. 
No, I was like, ah, okay, there's another way as well, you know? Yeah, that's it, that's it. And I think when you get that, it makes you enjoy both sides more. It, it means you're not stressed out your mind pulling your hair out on tour because you're worried about being at home. When you are at home, it's like, oh, cool, I can detach a bit. And now I've got a bit of like, you know, restorative balance where you feel like you're accomplishing things in your own right at home. And like, that is a big part of, of the touring thing. And, you know, there's so many ways to make money now as a creative or someone that maybe doesn't want a stereotypical job that there's no reason for someone to do an office job that they hate to then use all their holidays to be broke on a tour like you can get that right now like you know everyone can do something remotely you can learn a trade you can do these things that make it a bit more like realistic instead of the you know the polar ends of those like really scary situations so yeah it's quite weird i couldn't agree more man um and i think i i guess um you're saying that you know that, that this was a positive way to deal with with grief as well. It's just ringing around my head that like maybe take for granted that people who write have got the ability to do that because I know you know without getting too in depth about what what the grief that you went through. My dad passed away. Obviously, it was a, a heavy hitting thing, um, and it took me a while to properly properly deal with that. I remember going to this writing space, writing the the song "Keep Close" for him. First time I've ever, I mean, it was just a demo to show the boys. We obviously eventually went properly recorded, but like first time I've broke down like on a take, just kept it in at the end. And I sat there like blubbing and running, yeah. no signal, like <laughs> only deer walking about outside. I'm so mm-hmm. uh, like proper first time I, I really broke through yeah. to the point where I started laughing because I was like, this is ridiculous. Man. Wild, yeah. Like, right, that's exactly what he'd be saying right now. Like yeah. the song, that's a belter. Right, that's it. Yeah, you've, you've accepted it, and it was. If I didn't write, I don't know how I would have got there. Exactly. Yeah, and you need that as the kind of um, the vehicle to process what's actually happened. I listened to your episode um, with Scott Craig. Um, I ended up being on his podcast as well. But your episode with him, like, I, I have no issues with saying I was fully crying at the end of it. I was absolutely beside myself listening to both of you talk about your respective losses with your dads and. Oh my God, it's so powerful, like how you've both dealt with that respectively, you know, him, you know, really changing his life from what he hated into this like powerful athlete. And much like yourself, you found something that has, has given you ownership of that kind of process and allowed you to kind of process it in some fashion. And you need that. Like you said, what, how on earth would you cope if you didn't do that? You'd be, you'd be like in the gutter, you'd be making awful life choices. You'd be doing things that would like tarnish the relationship you had with that person so it's like it is it's really difficult and it's important to have those things to get through it, i think 100 it just makes you think like you know we talk about the things that are hard and those like highs and lows we get but like you said it's a rhetorical question but i don't know how like people who don't have that outlet do it mm-hmm. and just work and they're expected to just pop that in a box and <laughs> i know yeah. just save that for later <laughs> so it's a big one um you said you started touring around 17. So what's like been your trajectory to join in these kind of bands and, and, and being a kind of full-time musician and, and not yeah, playing music, but you're a music lecturer, you're a, a booker, manager? Uh, a bit of everything, yeah. Um, it's been pretty broad. So I basically went from high school, left at 17 to go study music at college. Um, and I I basically got a session gig out of that. I met a, a pop musician who needed a session guitar player. And um, I was like, right, I can try the session thing. I'll apply for a uni and we'll, we'll see which one goes better and we'll do that. Um, so I actually got into the uni that I wanted to go to to study music. Um, but I also got the, the, the tour to do the session gig. Um, so I ended up missing like my first month of uni, I think, because I was on this tour and then I turned up and I was kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm <laughs> kind of meant to be here. Um, and so, yeah, that was my first kind of like um, dip of the toe into that. And then, yeah, all the way through uni, I studied, well, I studied, I have a music degree. And then so I ended up joining bands that were touring and nobody ever seemed to know what to do. So I was just always the guy that was like, oh, I'll send some emails, I'll make some phone calls. And like every band I've ever been in, I've just found ways to make tours happen. If that's like Scottish Weekenders or down into like Borders or into England. Um, yeah, I just always find ways to do that. So by the time I got to the end of uni, I'd ended up going over to Europe um, with a band that I was in at the time called Out of Samsara. That was the first one that kind of got off of the ground that was kind of like um pelican russian circles god is an astronaut that kind of thing um and so i'd kind of cut my teeth a fair bit in that band um but as soon as uni finished 
I had been so burnt out on on music and and life in general. I was kind of at a bit of a kind of uh, crossroads with a lot of things, and so I had uh, booked a ticket to Australia and had like five hundred quid in my bank, and was just like, I need out of here. Like I was going through a breakup, my parents broke up, whole bunch of like bad shit happened. And um, I essentially like left the country for two years, gave up music a wee bit. And um, while I was away in Australia, I met my wife, she's German. And then I moved to Germany for a year. Um, and then so after two years, I was kind of like, God damn, I really miss music. Like I miss playing. I miss like the hustle and bustle of Glasgow, to be honest. Like I really miss living in Glasgow a lot. So yeah, we moved back in 2012. And then I started um, Martins Under Oceans. That was kind of like the next band that got off the ground. And that was a big breakthrough one for me um, because that was like a proper kind of like UK, European tour and festival appearances, like endorsements, like, yeah, really kind of stepped up what I was doing before I went to Australia. Um, and yeah, at that point I was kind of like, yeah, I reckon I can make a pretty good go of this. And I'd kept the booking kind of skills up and kept all my contacts from like touring and stuff. And because that band was getting quite a bit bigger, um, I guess people saw that I was doing an OK job and then asked me to book some tours for them. Um, and that was a lot of like local bands like Halo Tora, Vasa, um, Sudden Burst of Colour, like a lot of kind of like instrumental or kind of obscure sort of bands. Um, and that went pretty well. So I started basically running a business where I was tour managing, booking tours, touring myself. And then I started lecturing one day a week at a college that I got asked to do as well. So I had a pretty good sort of setup going. Um, and that's where Global City Music Management came from. Um, and so I was just like juggling all those things for um, a couple of years. Mountains Under Oceans ended up breaking up. And at the last gig, we did um, a band called Sectioned were the opening act. And that's when I met Ped, who is like the brain behind Sectioned and Frontier. And so obviously my band ending and his band being on that bill, I was like, yeah, I, whatever you're doing, I want to be involved. It was genuinely one of the most offensive musical things I had ever seen. It was the, the gig out block that we had finished on. And uh, they like they literally emptied the building everybody left as soon as they started playing and uh yeah, i was just so impressed by it um and so yeah basically they had a couple of lineup issues and um they asked if i would join pretty much and i was like yeah absolutely they've like played with some massive bands and it's like you'll have this as well like you know when you meet someone that's kind of climbing the ladder a bit and you know they've got a vision and you just know they're going to go somewhere like i saw that with ped and so I was like, yeah, whatever you need, if it's a booker or a guitar player or both, I'm in sort of thing. And then eventually the personnel within section didn't really pan out. It didn't really work. Um, yeah, the, the lineup just wasn't really working. And so then at this point, he had written a record with uh, Frontier, his own other side project. Um, and that was in 2015. And uh, that was a record called Orange Mathematics. And it just, it blew up. It was like the biggest thing on the internet. It was all over like Rolling Stone, Bandcamp's like highest selling record the day that it came out. Um, and yeah, it just absolutely went massive. And so at that point, that's when Ped was like, do you want to just like hop onto uh, Frontier and we'll see if we can kind of make that work as a thing. And then, yeah, it basically just like grew from there and we've just been touring ever since within that band. Um, but for, yeah, for anyone that doesn't know, it's it's quite um, technical, heavy, kind of jarring music. A lot of people compare it to like Meshuga or uh, Dillinger Escape Plan, Carbomb, that kind of thing. Um, very polar to what I do with Lyft. But um, yeah, I think sometimes you need the palate cleanse if you've done too much of one sometimes. <laughs> unbelievable because it's exactly the kind of thing um and again no criticism to people like this like if you're not if you've never tasted a type of food you can't really discuss those flavors um but people like that aren't into how technical the guitar is and the timings and stuff that you guys have to be tight with we just go that is a racket oh <laughs> uh, all the time all the time <laughs> I'll, I'll be told like i'm I'm, I'm, I think I'm quite good at this with music. I know so many people, yourself included, like talented, talented people. You'll be the same. You don't need to be a fan of all those bands. It doesn't mean you're not a fan of their work and their ability. Yeah, right. I listen to the stuff and like my mate Stephen is a massive fan. He's seen you guys so many times, Stephen mm -hmm. Bruce. And I'm not listening. I'm like, man, like I can't, I just can't like get where the times are. <laughs> But then watching like you and the other guitarists do like you know your playthroughs and you're like that is so technical. But obviously, yeah. <laughs> just together, it is just so. What is it you call it? I wrote it down. You like math it. core, a lot of people kind oh, of refer yeah. to it as yeah, yeah, Sonic Terror. Yeah, I mean that it's like. That, like I, I need to be like fully up front Ped writes all of the music and I, I kind of learn it and then I do all the back end stuff but to, to play it yeah it is it takes so much time when he sent me the record 
yeah, effectively when he asked me to join, he was like, here's the record, learn as much as you can, and then I'll fill in the gaps of stuff that you can't learn. But it's like, imagine giving someone an F1 car that's never ridden a bike. Like, it's kind of like that. And I was just a bit like, how am I meant to learn this? Like, what? it's so mad. Um, and it took, I think, probably six months of nearly three or four hours a day of practice to, like, get my chops up for it. Um, so it, yeah, it's quite challenging. But I think it's like... It's one one part of it is the record and the recorded side of the music, but another side of it is the live thing. And I think people that maybe don't like listening to that music that much, if they would come to see it, they would probably have another sort of um, sort of like view on it because it's very much a visceral, all encompassing experience. And sometimes the music is the secondary thing; it's not the primary thing in the room. Um, and that's been my favorite thing about this band is like, you know, I grew up loving bands like The Chariot and like Norma Jean and like bands that create a feeling in a room and whether that's with one note or a hundred notes or no notes and just climbing on things like that to me is like what music is it's making those feelings that you can't explain and Frontier is a way for me to contribute to that and uh, I think that's another way to maybe view it if people are just like oh that's heavy and shouty music you know. (laughs) 100 then like I I kept saying this you know Steve has asked me to come along it hadn't worked out a couple of times and the in kind of Glasgow and stuff like that, but we had planned to go to a few festivals, you know, if uh, I'd, I'd seen you on Bills before. Um, did you play 2000 Trees? Um, it was Arctangent, the kind of sister yeah. festival. Yeah, I played that a couple of times. Yeah. So I'd been kind of angling and when my friend Callum, who's in the band, when he was living here, he's in Canada just now, I kind of wanted to go, right, we'll get to one of these festivals, <laughs> hoping it would have been in the pandemic time. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. And I think seeing you guys in a tent or like, you know, outdoor, that that would be... It's wild. Yeah, <laughs> it's so much fun. It's just because there's so many people. And like when we do our headline runs, like the like the club venues that we do, like maximum, the biggest ones we get in London are like 600 cap. And that sells out. That's really good. Paris is like maybe half of that. But everything else is like a typical DIY gig, anything from 10 to 50 people. So when we're allowed on a stage in front of like four or five, 6,000 people, it's it's so much more amplified. There's actually a few videos um, on, on YouTube from our last Arc Tangent set from the Audio Tree guys. And like watching it back, it's, it's so cool to see that like people give that a chance on, you know, essentially like a commercial scale because it shouldn't be in a commercial workspace of any sort. So yeah, it's really cool to get those chances to do the the bigger sort of bills i'll get you to send over like all these different links for uh, the show notes and this because i know mm-hmm. i know a lot of people um you know they'll, they'll listen to things and maybe not clued up in all the different genres of people i'm interviewing and they're always like hey, what did they do here what did they do there but i think it's important not just to give spotify links with the, yeah. <laughs> uh, different for lift that's definitely like a listen and chill but to yeah. see these things live you'll, you'll get a lot of what you're talking about uh, I did actually want to, I remember seeing you post up about how you'd met your wife and I yeah. always wanted to ask you because it sounds such a, a lovely story. Oh, nice. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it's so like, um, yeah, I mean, it is, it is just like an old fashioned romantic sort of thing. So yeah, I, I'd been in Oz for like four or five months at that point and um, I'd kind of done a bit of a road trip from Sydney down to Melbourne and it was just one of those pure life chance encounters. I went to a hostel that was fully booked and then they sent me across the road and it was the one across the road that I met her in so if there was one less person in the first hostel I never would have met her so yeah I went to this uh, hostel stayed there for a while and um you know, it was, it's quite a communal sort of place. A lot of people in Australia are living in hostels for like two, three months at a time. So they build like these little kind of family communities. So I just kind of got absorbed into one that she was in. And um, yeah, we just kind of hit it off and, and went on like nice walks around the city. And she was working in a bakery and I would like pick her up and we just like get to know each other. And it was a bit of a whirlwind. So it was like basically a month we'd spent in the hostel. And then um, I was going uh, up to Byron to go do a bit of a farming job. And we were kind of like, well... I don't know if this is more than like a holiday romance or, or whatever, but I had come from a breakup and so had she. So we're both kind of a bit tentative. But so I'd flown up to Byron and then she was like, um, you know, how are you feeling? Because I <laughs> everything sucks. <laughs> and I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, life's miserable when you're not here. Um, and so we basically did like two weeks of long distance and then she moved up to Byron and then we did like another one or two months there. So collectively, we'd only known each other for three months by the time she had left. Uh, her visa was up. So she went back to Germany. And we did like maybe another two months of distance. At that point, I went to New Zealand for a bit. And then um, 
yeah, we just kind of knew that there was something kind of special there. So I was like, well, I'm kind of like over the constant backpack and things. So if if you're up for it, why don't I move to Germany and we'll just kind of see how that goes, um, which sounds mental now being she was 21 and I was 22 and I didn't speak a word of German. I had a music degree, which was at that point quite useless. Uh, and yeah, we just basically just took a risk. I flew back out there and then lived with her family for a year learned the language, um, worked a few different jobs around there. And then she wanted to go to uni to study to be a nurse. And she got into um, the one in Scotland. And so we we're like, yeah, well, let's go back. I want to do music. You want to study um, and improve English skills and things like that. And yeah, now we've been together, um, oh, like just over 10 years and married for three. So yeah, man, it's been a hell of a journey. <laughs> That's lovely. Eh? Like, I, I don't know if like, you know, younger me like would connect would be so open and connected with that. But after going through it, you know, I always thought I was with my wife, my wife who was my girlfriend, obviously for about seven or eight years before I proposed. And it was always like, wait till the time's right, wait till we're absolutely sure, you know. And then pop the question, and I always thought it, it's just about the girl, you know, like nothing will really change for me. Like I'm I'm open about how much I love her and stuff, but engagement doesn't really matter to me. And as soon as you know you do it, you're like, holy shit! A new burst of it all, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's so um, yeah. It is it like I was a bit like that too? I kind of wasn't even bothered by the idea of marriage at all, really. And then I don't know, something just kind of changed. Like she basically um went to go do a placement in Portugal, at a hospital over there for three months, and um. Yeah, we'd been living in Scotland for about three years at this point. So we'd been together f uh, maybe like five years, I think, altogether by the time she'd done this placement. And something just happened in my brain where I was like, oh, my God, like if she's not around, like everything's bad. Like I, I can't cope as a human when she's not around. And yeah, just something was like, yeah. So I flew out. Basically, we, we had planned a road trip around Portugal and I proposed on that trip. And it was exactly that thing. I was just like, man, there's like this new level i've accessed of like bonding and you know what the relationship is and then the same thing happened after we got married it was like another version of that and i guess that's kind of when you know you've got the right person is that you keep accessing these new levels of like what your relationship means to you and um and yeah i mean i'll, I'll be like open about the this lift record like me and her had lost a baby at, at the beginning of um like the tail end of summer like mid lockdown last year and that's what spurred this whole record on and it was just like that whole idea of like, I need something that's going to like keep me strong enough to keep us both like, you know, afloat in this whole sort of thing. And and that's how like to me, the record feels very emotionally like powerful because it, it feels like me kind of holding up like the relationship as well as the kind of experience and how I got through it. So and that's like another one of those things in your life where it's like you just access this new notch up of what your marriage and what your relationship is and what your bond is. And it's a really powerful thing like a, a, like a, I'm just like I feel so sad for people that will never have a relationship like that and that sounds very pompous and like um, maybe arbitrary to some people but I think like yeah th this just such an important thing in your life is to have those connections and relationships with people and if, if you don't have it then it's a real sad thing I think. This is first of all man I'm really sorry to hear that you know that's uh, I can't imagine it so yeah but I guess like you know not just a love like that new found level of respect for each other to help each other through that mm -hmm. levels things up as well doesn't it yeah yeah absolutely no 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 single moment recently but recently i've been feeling like first time not first time in my life but like been having like anxiety attacks i don't really not like uh, i don't want to belittle like that because i know some people get them like crippling uh, mm -hmm. i think mines have been it's too putting too much on your plate and stuff but I'll like go for a walk and feel like I can't really breathe and you're like holy shit you know and yeah speak to someone and you're mincing your words and I'm like I just need to go away up the back of the park like in the golf course but like be alone and like yeah. sit. you know and I hadn't been wearing like this will sound nonsense I when we got married I was sitting to Nick I was like I've got tattoos on my fingers like they they're a personal thing to me and her I was like I didn't really wear a ring, you know, I, I touch hair product all day when I'm playing my guitar, like it, I play football and I play in goals, I was like, the ring will never be on, mm -hmm. but just the last few days I was like having these anxiety and, that, and I've just, I just put that back on and it's just been a wee like anchor thing, you know, in a wee moment, oh, just, amazing. the ring's got no power, but yeah. what does it represent, you've got someone there and like, you know, things are okay, like, yeah, we, yeah don't really matter when you've got something in your life you know so yeah totally that's so nice yeah, yeah absolutely I think um 
like even if it's just like a visual thing that gives you that little bit of like um release like it sounds like a weird comparison but to me that would almost make me think of someone that's really anxious that has to smoke cigarettes like if they have the cigarette then they're fine if you've got that in sight that ring in sight that's your like deep breath and your like reset and yeah whatever that thing is for people like i think they, they need a bit of that sort of like yeah that kind of normality to come back I listened to the records um, in patches over the last week, but I listened to them full again today. Um, and is it Wave or is it Waves? Waves, yeah. That one is so, so beautiful, man. I mean, they're yeah. all really cool and I love it. And it's one of those ones I know I'm going to have to listen to more and more to hear everything, you know. Mm -hmm. That one just from the off, like really, really hit deep. But um, yeah, it's certainly going to, I'm going to listen to it with New Year's now and, and you know, the importance of it. But um, like you said, not um, not turning anything into a positive or that, but like seeing, you know, that like you said, there can be beauty coming out of it. And I think that represents COVID as a whole as well, doesn't it? Like, mm -hmm. it was, like people were hit financially, a lot of people's health was hit, but there has been time to reset and like try things without that stress of like a whip behind your back almost yeah you know? yeah yeah definitely yeah it's it's weird I've been trying to find all the positives in this last kind of like year and a half and like you know generally speaking I'm extremely lucky right so basically when I was running that um global um <laughs> global city music management when I was running the business I'd worked myself into such like anxiety and depression that I pretty much made a life choice to be like, right, I'm done. Like, I need to like fix this because I had a fully like psychotic episode and like, yeah, it was really, really bad. And so then I was like, right, I need to like make some big, big changes. And um, and so, yeah, effectively um, in the February of 2019, I had taken a job lecture in full time in Aberdeen and just like wrapped the business entirely. I, I kept working with Frontier. Um, and, and the wild thing is I'd managed to get to a point where I was managing my favorite band of the last like 10 years. And so I watch you from afar from Northern Ireland. I got to a point where I was managing a band that big and it still wasn't enough. Like it just couldn't kind of get me through. So like I'd built this whole thing up, had a huge breakdown and I'd, I just wrapped it all. And um, yeah, I took this lecturing job up here in 2019. COVID hit in the uh, February, March of 2020. So just a year before like the music industry completely grinded to a halt, I had made this big change so that I could kind of ultimately ended up having a lot of security and like no financial issues throughout the whole thing if I had not done that like I, I can't even explain how fucked I would have been because like no bands were touring meaning I would make no money also like I was lecturing for three hours a week so I, there was no money coming from that either really so like there was just a big stars aligning sort of thing that happened before um COVID for me and it's just so weird that like sometimes something in life leads you down a path and then it ends up being something that can be such a savior um, throughout that. And so, yeah, basically, like I, I feel like incredibly lucky. Like obviously I've had some really like bad things happen throughout COVID, but in the grand scheme, it's like, yeah, I'm fine. You know, like I, I have job security. I have a house. I have like a wife, like everything is good. Some of my best friends in the music industry have, you know, they've basically not been able to work at all and, you know, are like ill with um, mental health, trying to work out how to even pay the bills. So like, yeah, I make no gripes about how lucky I am. Um, so it's easy for me to see the positives in COVID, but, you know, a lot of people just aren't in that same boat. So it's like, yeah, I don't want to come across as being like, oh, you know, why can't you see the good sides when, you know, I'm on the, the easy side of that fence? <laughs> I might not even edit this out because it's in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> One sec. Here we go. Bingo. That's uh, how professional this point. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying like different places in the shop, like where they would go, and then I was like, right, here's perfect, but I forgot yeah. to plug it in. No uh, yeah, no, I don't think it comes across that way whatsoever, man, but it's like, you know, we all have our own situation. Um, I always compare, this could be a nonsense like thing, but just listen to like old um, the Vedic texts and all these old um, like religions and stuff like that, how like you know, you go through all these incarnations and it's like there's so many um, versions of alternative realities or how many lives you live and all this mm -hmm. stuff, which is quite interesting. So uh, effectively, we are all, you know, the one being and we're all going to have ultimate um, experiences of everything you possibly could. 
Uh-huh. I also think it's like when you play a role playing game or football manager or whatever, and it's like we all start with like 500 points, and mm-hmm. it's like we might have like 10 for charisma, but like three. <laughs> and this, I think we all all get peaks and troughs in our life, you know, like no mm-hmm. one's gonna, some people are gonna have it way worse, like that, yeah. right? of course, but like generally speaking, those of us who are lucky enough to live in a society where, you know, we're not oppressed and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to have bits that uh, are really fortunate and we're going to have stuff that's really, really harsh. And it's like, how can you pick yourself up? And when you learn that, how can you help others when they're needing picked up? And yeah, no one's getting a free ride, are they? So it's, no, no, exactly. It's funny. I've been thinking a bit like that the last little while. And like, I think it's just natural when you get a bit older. I'm 33 next week, actually. And there's just like, I think something after the age of 30 just starts to happen in your brain where you're a bit like, right, so I'm probably coming up to the halfway mark of my life so like what what do you want to do like you know there's not much left and then I kind of get to that thing where you can't help but compare what other people do sometimes and what they're like and I just always kind of boil it down to like 24 hours in a day like no matter who you are you have 24 hours in a day it's just up to you what you do with those and then ultimately that's just a collection of those hours so I've kind of been trying to like think about it like that instead of like oh why do they have what I don't have and much more like well they have the same time like what what is the thing that they're doing instead of like why don't you have that so yeah I find those kind of conversations pretty interesting actually about that or they like push you know like you can see it with material things or if someone you know like Scott Craig for example the absolute machine and fitness and you can think oh I'd like to be like that I'd like to be like that but you don't realize that they're obsessing and driven to that thing <laughs> I'm not yeah. saying like Scott for example doesn't have loads of other great you know but he's known for and should be so proud of himself and is so passionate about the fitness thing you know that's right yeah, yeah, yeah. Yourself into you know the, the life you lead and the and the music you make and how your life is revolved around music some like myself goes that is unbelievable like i'd love a life like that you you could see some you know so we all people deserve credit for the good things they've done but that's because they've worked really they put hard. the time in that's it yeah of those 24 they sleep for three and they grind for the rest like that's it you know <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, recently um you've got an audio tree session is that oh, like, man. coming out it, it's out now yeah it was oh it, it feels mental to even say it. I've watched audio tree sessions like pretty much since they started and um I, I was so lucky to meet um Austin who's one of the hosts uh, when he came to Arc Tangent the last year that it ran we headlined a, a stage there and so he had actually filmed some Frontier stuff and like I never thought for a second they would take up, uh, you know, a project that is effectively, you know, one record deep and was is brand new. And me, like, you know, I, I'm only, you know, like a, a pin drop in the ocean of what's out there musically. So, but yeah, he was in into it. So yeah, they they booked in this um, audio tree worldwide um, sort of series. And so it's me and Adam Betts. Um, so he's one of the collaborators on the record. He's in Three Trap Tigers, plays with like Pete Tong and. Goldie and a bunch of these like big artists but yeah me and him wrote a song together uh, on the record and um yeah we did like one of these like uh lockdown live kind of things where you film our own parts uh, do the audio separately and then kind of put it all together and it was such a pleasure honestly I was just like so happy to see it go out through such an amazing company and um it was really scary to be honest I hadn't done any live music since um that gig in Helsinki in October 2019 and I re- I did this like two months ago uh, in 2021 so like and that was with instruments that I'm not overly confident with in a performance capacity so I basically had like two stacked keys um two sets of pedal boards and then separate feeds for guitar um, and then a bunch of like loopers to kind of make it all work together so it's like pretty full-on and much more intricate than my usual sort of performance sort of stuff but um it came out really well Cal McMillan uh, shot and edited the whole thing and um Ian McLeod did all the mixing on it and uh, yeah I'm, I'm super proud of it I, I couldn't believe how good it turned out I was so happy with it oh man I look forward to watching that I'd seen you post about it and I knew there was a wee clip but I didn't realize it was up online but I'm a massive fan of the, the audio tree stuff as well and I think you know Part of the reason you're saying you're thankfully put you on, but part of that reason is because, in the, I mean, in the best possible way, in a lot of cases, you've never heard of a band. And, and then you watch the audio tree, and yeah. then, well, now I know this band, and they're phenomenal. So the guys, yeah. <laughs> whoever it is that selects, if it's just him, or, they've got great ear for, for yeah. me. Obviously, they don't feel any of that pressure to only put on things to get them the clicks. They trust that their audience trusts them. Yeah, that's, that's true. And then take what you like, you know. 
Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Yeah, they've just got such a good like quality control. Like I've never seen anything they've put out that's naff, and they've, you know, like they're they're basically a not for profit. Like they don't make any money out of what they do. They just they want the artists to get like as seen as far as possible and. Like they're quite like so they yeah they just work really hard to make sure that international people are included as well and like it's, it's such a minor thing but people that aren't from Scotland won't understand this but on their website they got it right they said I was Scottish it's like nobody in America does that and yeah there's like something as minor as that it's like yes yeah, so they actually care it's not just for like views or whatever yeah it's not like Dan from the United Kingdom <laughs> I know I know we won't get into that one but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sour Alba. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also saw that you were pretty stoked about uh, signing with Ven, Ven Records. Oh, uh, yeah. Bernard from Gallows fame. Were you a big Gallows fan or was it Massive. more? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. An enormous fan of Gallows. And again, like, so this, this whole Lyft project has been blowing my mind since, like, I don't know, like I'd basically gone in this like tunnel vision of like, right, I'm going to make a couple of songs. If they're good, I'll send them to some people that can maybe add some musical stuff to them. If that then is good, I'll maybe send it to one of two labels. And one of them was Ven, one of them was Brainfeeder. And yeah, um, Lags over at Ven, who is in, in Gallows, uh, was just like, yeah, I absolutely love it. Send me it when it's finished. And that was really good because it kind of gave me a bit of uh, a need to finish it. Whereas before it was just like a thing that I just wanted to be immersed in and I didn't really have an end product or an end goal. But him being like, yeah, if, if you get it done and we like it, then we'll, we'll put it out pretty much. So, um, yeah, from there, I just kind of had a bit more of a focus for how I wanted it to sound. And that's what kind of gave me the idea for the right collaborators. Um, and so, yeah, Ian Maciak from Machine Drum, um, uh, me and him wrote a song together. And then we have another one with Finlay Marnell, um, amazing Glasgow musician. Um, and then Adam Betts is the other one. So, yeah, we ended up with these like seven tracks. Um, and it's like it's probably not like a typical label for this kind of music, but like Venn is, is very broad in as much as it's it's all about kind of DIY underground music, but some of that is on a commercial scale. So like Gallows are actually signed to Venn. He's got Bob Villain who just had Jason Butler from Let Live and Fever 333 on a track, like um, Wargasm, uh, they're out with like Young Blood and Idols. Like there's some pretty established acts on that label. Some of them are punk, some of them are grime. Um, mine is electronic and kind of like jungle kind of stuff. So. Um, it was mental that it happened. Yeah, I didn't think for a second it would because, like, why would it? It's it's not. It's got no history. It's just a guy writing a record in his in his house. So yeah, it was like I was floored by the fact he wanted to take it on. So it was a big compliment. That's awesome, man. And had he known your? Pre Did you know him already from previous work? <laughs> Not at all. And this this speaks volumes about his ethos. Like I did the old school, like I'm going to send a demo in and he got back to me on it. He was like, oh, cool. Yeah, um, there's been not much good stuff coming in lately. Let's set up a call. And he literally phoned me the next day and we chatted for like an hour. And, you know, that's such like no label does that. No one's going to waste their time phoning people that they don't really know or anything like that. Um, the only link really is that the drummer in Gallows is a big Frontier fan and he'd come to a couple of shows. So maybe the name had been, <clears throat> excuse me, had been kicked around the, the kind of backstage a bit, but yeah, no formal connection or anything, but yeah, he's such a lovely guy. Like he's, he's, he's so, so thoughtful about um, the, the artists, like the deal that they kind of make with the bands, the effort they put in and the kind of like the freedom that they give you. Like, I've never had that from a label. I've been signed and acts before. So like the whole thing, like I can't speak highly enough of, of them at all. And also as a big like kind of nerdy thing, like the vocalist in Gallows now is from one of my favorite bands of all time, Alexis on Fire. So it's just like so many of these cool little things happening or it's just like, man, I'm like 32. And now I get signed by a label that I want to be signed by putting out a record with some like a really big accomplished artists. And it, it's kind of like one of those things. It's like you, you just can't pack it in. You just have to keep on finding ways to make what you want and getting the people involved that you want. And eventually you'll kind of create something that you're you're happy with and people might connect with. So yeah. Man, it's not, you know, it's not to, to I, I, I'm just trading carefully here because I honestly feel how much this means to you. And I, I want to get my words right because I'm on the wavelength. But it's not that, you know, everything happens because, you know, for a reason, because that, that is too easy to say that, but it, it just does show you in the name of, of the record, everything, it, it's it's gone the best way it could have out of real tough times, you know? Like it's, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, really just, it's been channeled in the correct way and you're getting the rewards from the universe or from a higher, whatever it should be, but that's due to 
you putting all those little butterfly effects into motion. <laughs> oh. No, thanks, man. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I try to be humble about things. Like I don't know. Like sometimes I see it as a bit of luck and a bit of hard work, and sometimes one's more than the other. But yeah, I've I've definitely worked hard on it. I ain't gonna lie about that. It's been a year of my life. You need you need luck, or you need uh, the right place, right time, the right years, the right you know things can happen. That things can miss. Obviously, you and your wife that's mm. falling into place at the right time. But mm. um, it's. 97% hard work always man like yeah. things don't just happen if you're not ready for them you know mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point the opportunity can come and you're not able to take it or you don't give a good account of yourself when you do take it when he listens to your your thing if it's not been done correctly he's not going to give you that call back so mm -hmm. yeah all fair point. The hard work man so mm -hmm. yeah it's important you know that <laughs> yeah thanks <laughs> we touched upon it before we started recording as well man um i remember You'd struggled with the decision. Uh, obviously, you've spoke about how you kind of came back to Glasgow, um, but you kind of struggled with the decision. You know, to should you be moving to like the countryside and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. you're just into a new house. You were saying, and so you've been there what a couple of years now. I've I've been in this house for a week, but I've been back up north for two years. Yeah, basically. So yeah, like we had said kind of prior. Like I'd got to this like stage where I was just like chronically depressed and uh, like an anxious bag of nerves all day, every day after like running this business and like feeling the pressure of 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 that. So, yeah, I had kind of just made this choice to like change something. Um, like I said, I had this kind of like episode where I basically went missing and. I was just really, really ill and uh, I had no backup plan, nothing like, yeah, basically living, barely paying rent for like five or six years. And, you know, when you get to 30, something has to change. Like you can't do that forever. So, yeah, I had uh, another one of those, like the universe lining up with me for some reason. A job offer came up to lecture at a college up here um, in Aberdeenshire. And I didn't think for a second I would get it. Like I, I genuinely didn't to the point that I had um, not even put the application in until the last day uh, on the closing day. And I was like, well, if I don't put it in, then I'll be kicking myself, even if it's a no. So I'll just chuck it in and forget about it. And I did. I uh, didn't even think any more of it. Like three weeks later, they asked me for an interview. And I was like, oh, my God, right now I need to actually <laughs> um, see if, if, if this could happen um, somehow again. It, it did. And uh, yeah, I basically was walking, I was at this phase of my kind of mental health journey and breakdown or whatever, where I was just walking for like two or three hours every night. And um, I was in, I, like I lived in the South Side at the time. So I was just walking by Clockwork, uh, the pub just at um, Florida. And uh, I got a phone call from the place and they're like, oh yeah, we'd, we'd like to offer you the position. And um, I, like I had a quick chat with them, but I literally I burst into tears and I, I felt like I'd won the lottery, honestly. Like it was a life changing sort of situation for me because it's like, it's like a big boy job, you know, it's like a lot of money, it's a lot of holidays, it's a lot of responsibility too, but it's like, it sets me up so that I can tour, it gives me like three months of holidays, um, but I can have like a real life that I'm proud of instead of like, I can't meet mates for a beer because I literally can't afford to go for a pint, like that's kind of where I was at. Um, and so yeah, did that and like two years later now, um, like music has bought me a house, like I, I, I never thought, I've never even lived in a bought house, like I grew up in rented houses and, and whatever, so like, the fact that that's happened is like fully just like blown my mind and uh, yeah like I moved in a week ago so um yeah I'm just kind of like coming to terms with like this whole thing still <laughs> it's been, man, it's been a grind <laughs> fantastic man so good thanks that's yeah man it's it's man. bizarre it's like I don't know like this is what we we're saying before it's like you need that balance like I I'm, I'm quite stressed with my job a little bit because it, it's a lot of pressure because it's like teaching up to like degree level with music but also the time off is like it lets me tour and not feel stressed and I can still like enjoy every day like I wake up and I talk about music every single day of my life and that's sometimes about music theory sometimes that's music business sometimes it's composition whatever it is and then I get to go on tour so like yeah it, it it couldn't have been any better and it was one of those universe sort of like giving you something back sort of situations and uh, yeah I, I don't take it for granted like I know I'm I'm so so lucky um but yeah it, it's an adjustment moving back up to Aberdeenshire like you're, you're from like rural Perthshire as well like you kind of get the deal it's it's very similar there's like you need to make everything happen around here musically creatively and that's one thing I'm kind of getting used to that's still a bit difficult um also, you talked about, you know, anxiety and stress of uh, having to fit around tour from, from work and that as well. But even that relationship with you and your wife as well, when 
you haven't had to say for a year or two, like, we, we probably can't go on holiday because I've got to use my weekends and tour, yeah. tour from the call centre. Yeah. Tour and, you know, you get support, but you know that that's not fully okay. And why would it? No. You're treating <laughs> But it's not because there's a, it's just that that's what you have to do. So this gives you that breathing space as well, you know. Exactly. That's a really, really good point about that. Because like for every successful musician that the general public see, they don't see the 10 mates or the three family members or the wife or the girlfriend that's really given them the foot up for the last 10 or 15 years because it doesn't come alone. It's not just you and your instrument and you and your band. It's the people that let you sleep on the floor. It's the credit card that's fucking paid your last three van hires. It's all of those things collectively. So yeah, taking that pressure off the immediates around you as well is also like quite a weight that lifts off you when when you get a bit of breathing space. And I, I can't ex- like express the importance of finding that in some way, like like you said, with you with opening the shop and having a bit more of your own sort of stability like that, it has to happen. Like it, it'll end up being the straw that breaks the camel's back with something stupid that ends up sending you into like a spiral if, if you don't fix those kind of things. 100% man. Um, well, I guess well, I want you into the holy day, man. But what's what's kind of next for you? Uh, obviously, with the lift stuff, I'm sure a lot of promo and things like that. Um, but in terms of you know your management stuff, your election, what what does the get back to touring? What does the next year look like? Yeah, pretty varied. So um, I've got a couple of interesting projects. I work with um, quite an interesting documentary maker um, from a, a TV course just now that was yeah f- full time documentary maker prior to teaching at the college as well. So he wants to do a bit of like a focus piece on um, like me, I guess. Yeah. So he's going to kind of follow me around my like my life and like I do a lot of like uh, outdoor stuff, a lot of surfing, a lot of wild swimming and like distance running. So I think he kind of wants to get a little bit of the nitty gritty behind what it's kind of like to be a creative up here and not just be in the city. So I think that's going to be quite a fun thing that will kind of come out at some point um, this year. Um, there's a Frontier documentary that came out yesterday, actually. Um, and it's like a behind the scenes look at uh, being on tour in Europe with uh, a band that do everything from basement shows to festival shows to support shows. Um, so that's on YouTube. You can just look at Frontier, uh, A Trail of Noise is the name of that. Um, so that's kind of led into this new campaign for the new Frontier record. And that's coming out um, between now and Christmas. There's not a release date I'm allowed to say yet, um, but that'll be out. Um, and yeah, just lots of those kind of things lift after October, I don't really have a huge amount um, for. I've done the release. I've got a couple of little kind of videos to come out just with like playthrough kind of things. Um, but yeah, that's eaten up all of my mental bandwidth for about a year now. So I'm quite happy to kind of put that to the side uh, after next month um, or maybe between now and October. Um, and then, yeah, Frontier will take full full attention again, which um, I'm quite excited about. I've not really done the kind of chucking myself off a stage um, thing in a little while. And that's like my, my big outlet. So I'm looking forward to that again. Um, but yeah, basically got a bunch of festivals next summer, um, all the usual sort of like metal ones. Um, so yeah, I'm sure folk will see it there if they fancy it. Do you plan to kind of play Lift Live much or is it going to just be our let it blow in the wind and be oh. up? I would I'd love to like I would really really love to do it as like a proper big live thing um a friend of mine from um he plays in fat suit um Craig McEnany um sorry not Craig McEnany what's his last name that's awful um I forgot his last name anyway my friend Craig that plays in fat suit um he's like just this virtuoso musician plays like every instrument and he was kind of like deconstructing uh, Craig McMahon sorry that's awful um he was deconstructing how I could do it live and I was kind of like that's interesting because that's like not the way I would have thought about it but it would probably work a bit better so um yeah I'm thinking about it but it's kind of it's quite like a pretentious kind of thing in its nature it's very expansive and cinematic so I like I would want it to be done right with like you know big screens and like an eight-piece band and like the whole sort of rigmarole so um who knows maybe I need to write more music I've only got 28 minutes of music so um, I need another record and then we'll uh, we'll try try that one but um I'd love to we'll see see how it goes Man, it's been, I've known of you for many years, but other than sat in the, the barber chair way, way back when I was training, I don't know if we've actually sat and had a proper convo ever, but that was an absolute pleasure, man. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think we'd maybe um, 
exchange the pint and block one time but yeah nothing of, of too much substance but man what a pleasure thanks so much for making the time to have a chat and it, it's so cool to see you really getting your business off the ground and, and kind of like getting busy with it so yeah i hope it all goes really well for you and uh, same with wolves man I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the the new bunch of stuff that's coming yeah man i'm excited just to as i say um Calum's in Canada just now. We're trying to think when we can get some pre-production done. He can tie it in with visiting family. But yeah, you know, no huge ambitions other than us making amazing music for our ears anymore, which is quite freeing. Yeah. And still as exciting, which I never saw coming, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> stuff and go, wow, I love what we made. And if other yeah. people do, that's amazing bonus, you know? So Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, getting back to that as well, man. But um Love what you're doing. I'm looking forward to checking out the documentary. I'm looking forward to hearing. I'm someone that really values the meaning behind music. It lets me hear it on different wavelengths and channels. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm probably going to like listen to that with a couple of beers in the dark now. I'm just really yeah. <laughs> doing that with the record. Um, so yeah, man, I'm excited um, to, to listen to that and to check out the documentary. Just send me a wee uh, kind of list of like things and links and I'll stick that out there for everyone that I'm sure I want to check out who's been listening to this. Awesome. Uh, and yeah, man, love to you and your wife and I hope everything yeah. was class this year for you, bro. Cheers. Thanks so much. We'll get a catch up next time I'm down the road, right? Anytime, man. Just message cool. me, okay? Yeah, we will do. Take care. Cheers, Kyle. Dan, take care, Bye. bro. Bye. Yeah, we're talking about